When I think about Elf, I often think about my father. This is a picture of my father serving in the Israeli army in the combat unit when he was 20 years old. I don't have any pictures of my father before this one. I don't know how he looked like as a baby or as a child. I don't know if I looked like him when I was younger or whether my kids look like him. The reason is because he was born in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was born in 1934 in Poland. And when World War II started, he was taken away, along with his family and the rest of the Jewish families, to the ghetto during the Holocaust. In these ghettos, they will surround them with fence to keep them trapped. There was no food, no water, and people were starving to death. They sometimes sent little kids away from the ghetto to try to find food and bring back. My father was one of these kids. He was skinny enough to fit through a hole in the fence and get out to, try to bring food to his family. One day, when he came back, he couldn't find his family. It turned out that they were taken away to a concentration camp and murdered. He was 10 years old when that happened. At that point, he needed to survive. He ran away to the woods and hid there for the next three years until the war was ended. Then he joined a youth group and immigrated to Israel. Growing up, I often tried to talk to my father, learn about his story, about our family, and how he was able to survive. But he was never able to share his story with me or anyone else. Every time he tried to talk about it, he would fall apart. He never dealt with the trauma. He keeps saying and hoping that one day he will be able to talk about it. But that one day never arrived. He died when I was in my early 20s from a heart attack. As a matter of fact, his entire life he struggled with a health condition that was the result of the toxic stress and trauma he experienced growing up during the war. That was in 1944, 75 years ago, during one of the darkest times of humankind. Today, in 2019, just a few miles out of this door, there are many children who are also growing up, experience their own version of toxic stress and trauma that of a war zone that could affect them their entire life. Meet Teresa. Teresa is 34 years old, and she lives in the Vell in North St. Louis. Teresa has five kids. Stephanie, who is the oldest, is 15 years old, and Nia, the youngest, is five years old. When I met Teresa, the first thing she told me is that she now developed this strict regimen for her kids to follow. That every time they hear gunshot in the middle of the night, they immediately jump off the bed and lie on the floor. They also have other rules, like they never ever allow to come near the windows in their apartment to look outside. She doesn't want them to get, to get hit by a bullet, and she doesn't want people in the neighborhood to think that her kids are watching them. They are also not allowed to go to the park or ride a bike outside, or even go alone to the bus stop. They can't spend any time outside. They can't go to friends in the neighborhood or bring friends over. Teresa said she is feeling like she is imprisoning them in their own home 
but she realized that even in their apartment, she can protect them from seeing what is happening outside. She told me this story about how one time uh, when, her son, when her son was 12 years old, he woke up in the middle of the night terrified and called her, Mom, Mom, come see, come see, be quiet. She looked outside to see a body of a teenager lying on their lawn who was just being shot in his head. Her son kept saying, Mommy, his brain is spilling out. His brain is spilling out. Teresa's experience is not unique. There are tens of thousands of people like Teresa in our region and millions of people like Teresa in our country. I have dedicated my life to search for evidence-based solution so children like my father and families like Teresa's can grow up in a healthy environment. When we think about health, we often think about genetics, but genetics only account for 10% of our health, and the rest is attribute to social and economic factors, to our physical environment, our health behavior, and the health care we receive. In neighborhoods like Teresa's, a great deal of people are living in poverty. There is no access to healthy food. It is not safe to exercise or even play outside. And there is a constant feeling of fear and stress. So you won't be surprised when I tell you that the health outcomes in neighborhoods like Teresa are drastically different from health outcomes of other neighborhoods like the one I'm working in at Washington University in Clayton. Babies born in the wheel are six times more likely to have low birth rate than babies born in Clayton. They are also twice as likely to die before their first birthday compared with babies born in Clayton. People live in the well are nine times more likely to be diagnosed with asthma-related disease. They are eight times more likely to be diagnosed with obesity and six times more likely to have diabetics than people living in Clayton. Looking at life expectancy, people living in Clayton are expected to live to the age of 85. But as you can see in this map, just moving a few miles down the road, life expectancy dropped to 67. Addressing these institutional and structural inequities will require tremendous work and cross-sectoral partnerships. A few months ago, with the help of a, a, problem, a program called Ascend STL, Teresa and her five kids moved to a new neighborhood in Ellisville near Chesterfield. Ascend STL is a local nonprofit that partners with the Housing Authority and other nonprofits to help families from low opportunity areas to move to neighborhood with high opportunity areas, such as Teresa New Home in Ellisville. Ellisville is a suburb west of Chesterfield and is considered a great place to live in terms of quality of schools and crime rate. Teresa is overjoyed with the fact that her kids can go to the park, ride the bike, and have kids over. She said they are finally experiencing what it means to have a normal childhood. Her kids now belong to the Rockwood School District, where they have 96% of the kids will graduate from high school, and 92% of the kids will continue to college, versus the Real School District, when, when only 60% of the kids will graduate from high school, and only 35% of the kids will continue to higher education. 
Within the last two years, Ascend STL have moved over 50 families to new high opportunity area. But much, much more work has to be done with over 400 families are in the waiting list. In fact, Teresa was on the waiting list for seven years waiting to leave her neighborhood. Just like my father, Teresa was able to get out through a hole in the fence. But no one should look for a hole in the fence. And we can't move everyone, nor do we want to. We need to revitalize all neighborhood so kids can grow up in a healthy environment. A successful effort to tear down the fence entirely is the story of Renaissance Place, a neighborhood in North St. Louis. It all started in the late 60s with a public housing project called Blue Mile. Like many other attempts in public housing, it quickly became a place with high poverty rate, high crime rate, properties were not maintained, and there were many vacancies. One of the residents who lived there, Paula, said it was just a building. She told me half of the people didn't work, half of them were not at school, most of them used drugs and had low self-esteem. She said she felt like little boys had no choice but to use to join a gang. In the 1990s, a private developer, McCormick Baron Salazar, and a nonprofit, Urban Strategies, form a partnership with the residents. Together, they applied for federal funding to revitalize the neighborhood and transform it to mixed income neighborhood where low income families live alongside of moderate income families. They also formed a resident board and put Paula as their leader. The resident board were involved in every decision from what color of the brick they should use to where they would like to place the park and how they would like the new development to look. And this is how the new development look today. They call it Renaissance Place. In addition to investment in housing, through these partnerships, they also develop additional programs to improve the health, education, and employment of the residents. They build a new daycare center that provide health services in addition to the regular services. They provide wellness check-in, check-up, uh, developmental screening, and home visitation. They also develop a new partnership to address the irregular work hours of many of the residents and to remove barriers to employment by opening a 24-hour daycare center. They also partner with the school district and develop additional programs for preschoolers ages three and four years old and for adults to obtain their GED. Paula, who still lives there, said she is so happy with how the, the neighborhood turned out. She said there are no more fights, no drugs, and little kids can run around. She is also very proud of her own three kids who all grew up in the neighborhood, went to school there, graduated from high, from high school and college, and now have their own families. To make a substantial impact and to improve the health of Teresa family and the Blue Meyer residents, it took the government, nonprofit, private corporation, and the residents to all working together collaboratively. Now, at Washington University, we are partnering with these organizations to develop the evidence on the effectiveness of these programs so we can expand them to more communities. It is the obligation of all of us to work hard 
every day to eliminate these unacceptable disparities so children in St. Louis can grow up in a healthy environment. My father got through a hole in the fence. Teresa got through a hole in the fence. But no one should have to look for a hole in the fence. We need to build strong partnerships so we can tear down the fence entirely. Thank you.